You're with Julian on the Brown Note and a review of the Todd Haynes Velvet Underground documentary. I'm ashamed I don't think I've seen any Todd Haynes films. Uh, he made his name back in the 80s with a very famous short film, Superstar the Karen Carpenter Story, where he filmed a biopic on the Carpenters with dolls, which is like little dolls. Um, and he's done some really acclaimed films. It's Velvet Goldmine, I'm Not There, the one about Bob Dylan. He's done a lot of music-related films. And I'm Not There was uh, famous for featuring six different actors uh, playing Bob Dylan, including uh, uh, female actors as well. And Carol got a lot of acclaim, but I didn't actually bother watching it. And Wonderstruck I know as well, but I've not seen that either. It's bizarre. So anyway, he's done a documentary about the Velvet Underground. I've been listening to the Velvet Underground a lot lately, and what's really struck me is how great almost everything they did was. They had four main studio albums, and the um, first one, the Velvet Underground and Nico, which came out in 1967, is regarded as ground zero for alternative music. Um, the esteemed Pitchfork magazine rated it the number one greatest album of the 1960s. Uh, Brian Eno gave his famous quote, which is that it only sold 30,000 copies, but everyone that bought it formed a band. And it's regarded as one of the most influential albums of all time. It's also one of the best albums of all time. It's an incredible record. And it overshone their subsequent three releases. They sort of became known as this great hope that sort of stumbled into nothingness due to a lack of acclaim. Um, but the three albums that came out after it are, are the next two are absolutely superb artistic statements, and it's only loaded where it all the midsection of that tapers off a bit. But when you add their live album, 1969, um, they've got an amazingly strong, consistently brilliant uh, discography. <clears throat> they were also managed in that early stage by... Andy Warhol and a fixture of his factory and of his um, exploding plastic inevitable art concept where they would play and have art, art house images posted up against them. They were his band. They were the house band for Andy Warhol's thing. Um, and obviously led by Lou Reed. But um, they are just an, an incredible band. I think I don't really appreciate how good a live band they were. That was never sort of established in stone or how their subsequent albums all contain a lot of their best material and if they have been you know they're, they're influential across a range of genres that seem to have the velvet underground and nico albums seem to birth entire universes of music the most notable would be the strokes ish garage rock sort of sound but also the icy call cool euro chic pop of uh, the nico sung tracks gothic music um, <clears throat> noise music like European Sun and dirges like uh, drone dirges um, like Run 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 and um, Waiting For My Man it birthed all these different universes but they also one of the only bands where it, three individual members birthed their own entire worlds themselves Lou Reed had his entire impact on music Nico became synonymous with this sort of gothic chic uh, wasted French European call cool thing um, which is still any record that comes out sounds like that immediately is referred to as being like Nico. And uh, John Cale became this um, bastion of art house music as well. So they had these three artists that came out of it. Uh, Todd Haynes has made a documentary that has got enormous acclaim. Uh, and it's done in an incredibly art house style that feels like a revolution in documentary making. Um, it tells the virtually completely chronological story of the band from their childhoods up until their split. Um, the music throughout is wonderful. It touches on all stages of their career, uh, and that is uh, amazing. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a, a compilation associated with it. And it's got lots of really interesting uh, underground facts about you know the way that this art scene develops. In uh, John Cowell talks about his horrific childhood in Wales where his grandmother wouldn't let his dad speak English in the house and he had to go to school to learn English to be able to talk to his dad. And it was uh, how he'd escaped to um, this very art house scene in New York where uh, John Cage, not John Cowell, and um, who's the drone guy? But basically this, this very avant-garde music she uh, scene had grown up and he recounts being uh, at the music school he was in and 
coming on stage and, and, and just smashing a piano with a hammer to pieces or with an axe to pieces and the uh, owner of the school running out in tears. And that's what it was like. These people were sort of thought of themselves as the serious artists of the world. And Lou Reed was this supernaturally talented songwriter and the two met and he was writing these really disturbing, depraved stories. But was obviously a brilliant lyricist and John Cale was enwrapped in his songwriting and said your music is being, you know, you're playing it folk or pop. You need music as extreme as your lyrics. And they gradually put together this perfect band. It's amazing how every element from Mo, Tucker, Mo Tucker's iconically simplistic medieval funeral drum, which is just using toms, uh, to John Cowell's amazing, and bass playing is amazing, but his um, viola, which is drony or shrieks on something like Venus in Furs. And Sterling Morrison, one of the greatest, uh, his, he plays very lyrical. They mention how he plays like Everly Brothers guitar, but he plays really pretty guitar over stuff like heroin. Um, and also plays some of the best rhythm guitar you'll ever hear. And in Lou Reed, one of the great songwriters, and how it all came together, and even Nico fitted perfectly together and, and, and it was a perfect creation that the world wasn't ready for at all. Um, and um, it does a faithful job in telling the story. It is so art house. It is incredibly, it uses so much of the footage of the period. And it's ironic that Andy Warhol, who filmed everything, filmed so little of the Velvet Underground playing live. There's actually no footage at all, which is completely baffling. Uh, and they talk about going around America and coming into, you know, up against the hippies of California when that was in full bloom and they hated them and vice versa. And Andy Warhol being sacked as their manager and the band gradually falling to pieces. Um, I don't think this is a perfect documentary and I don't think it's quite as good as everyone's making out. It isn't the definitive Velvet Underground documentary because you have to know a lot about the Velvet Underground to appreciate everything here. I don't think it puts them in context enough. It's a very insular documentary in that everything that happens happens in their world. I don't think there's enough context setting of what that art scene was doing and what it meant to the wider world, but also mainly that what the Velvet Underground meant to the wider world and, and, and what their impact was is not really there. It's, it's taken as a given that you know all of this. So it's a music, it's a documentary for fans who already know most of the story. Uh, and that to me was a little bit of a problem because the context of what their impact was is a huge part of the story. Uh, and another part, a problem I have with it is pacing. It is very, very, it takes forever to get to the first Velvet Underground album, a really long time. And it goes into minute detail along the way. And I'm not sure that all of that, all of those side stories and all of those extra characters were necessarily illuminating or necessary to the story. Some of it was hearing about the first bands that were before the Velvet Underground was all really interesting, but it goes on too long. And then it compresses everything that happened after the Velvet Underground album was released in too short a frame of time. So they're my quibbles with it. Um, I think if you wanted to watch a documentary to find out who the Velvet Underground were, I don't think it's a definitive one because it's so art house and so abstracted that it's made on a very sort of cerebral level where you're watching it like a Warhol film. You won't really get a sense of everything that was happening in music and why they challenged it and what happened after. Um, what, happened to these, what happened to music after they existed. And it compresses that remaining three albums into a very small ball. And another thing that is probably lacking is virtually none of Lou Reed's voice here. It's all uh, John Cale, Sterling Morrison, and Mo Tucker's narration. So they're brilliant. John Cale's an amazing character, but he falls out of the band after album number two. So his his narration is gone, and that's the key nar narrator to it. So you, for those for the remaining two albums, you don't even get really John Cale, and you don't get Lou Reed across the whole thing. He's shown sort of abstractly in in you know smoking cigarettes in footage but you don't hear much of his voice talking about it and i think given he was a, the beating heart of the band it's a little bit of a miss so it is a wonderful documentary it's brilliantly made it just stops short of being a definitive documentary so i'm going to give velvet underground a 
eight and a half out of ten. This is from that live album, and uh, it's a version of What Goes On, which is one of their best tracks. It features on the.